This is going to be Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to look at things like God's plan, purpose, power, penalties, and protection in our life. In Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Okay, now notice the phrase, the evening and the morning, is omitted from the verse, because the seventh day, the seventh day typifies the millennial reign, which will go on out into eternity without end. Uh, God's kingdom will go out into eternity without end. Once he uh, rules and reigns, he never stops ruling and reigning. And the verse said, he rested on the seventh day. However, we know that as God, he doesn't need rest in the sense that we need rest. He wasn't exhausted from creating the creation. He simply stopped working on the seventh day. Not because he was tired, that's just when he stopped. He blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. And this doesn't mean that Adam kept the Sabbath day. And Adam didn't have any work to rest from. Uh, God didn't command men to keep the Sabbath until Moses came along. And you can see this in Nehemiah 9, 13 through 14. It says, Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai, and spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments, and true laws, good statutes and commandments, and madest known unto them the holy Sabbath, and commandest them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses thy servant. So he made known unto them the holy Sabbath by Moses, and Moses wasn't around in Genesis 2, so nobody was keeping the Sabbath yet. And Saturday is the Sabbath, but the Seventh-day Adventists are wrong by saying that we have to keep the Sabbath today. Uh, in the New Testament, it says, it talks about the saints gathering on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. But Paul says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moons or of the Sabbath day, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. That's what he says in Colossians two sixteen through 17. So let, don't let anybody judge you about what you do with a certain day of the week. But you can see that God didn't give the Sabbath until he gave it to Moses on the mount. And when he introduced man to the Sabbath, he introduced it to Israel. In Exodus thirty-one thirteen, it says, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths you shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. So no one before Moses kept the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was for Israel and not born-again believers. Born-again believers today aren't required to keep the Sabbath. The Lord Jesus Christ is our Sabbath. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 29... He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Jesus Christ is our rest. He's our Sabbath. But getting into the outline, number one, God can make something out of you. Uh, Genesis 2, 4 says, These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. If God can make the earth and the heavens, He can make something out of a man. He made something out of nothing, so He can make something out of you. If you have witnessed to many people, many will tell you that they don't believe they can be a Christian because they can't live it. And... They couldn't live it in their own power. Uh, but once you are saved, the Holy Spirit of God begins to transform you. And Romans 12 verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And many people think 
They are making something out of themselves by going to college and getting a good job. And if you make something out of yourself, it's not going to be as what God can make out of you. However, you, you may uh, have success in this world, but you won't have your affections set on things above, and you're not going to have the rewards and crowns that you, that, uh, you would have had at the judgment seat of Christ if you let God make something out of you here. You'll never accomplish anything for eternity without God himself making something out of you. God can make the worlds. He can make something out of you. God can turn a drunkard and a harlot into someone that acts like a Christian. He can save them and get them in the book and transform them. And it's amazing that the same God who made the earth and the heavens wants to make something out of you. Uh, you're nothing. You're the size of an ant. Uh, he, but he wants to do something with you for his pleasure. Revelation 4.11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Uh, you weren't created to make something of yourself uh, by making money, by living for the world, and have your effect, having your affections on things down here. You were created for God, and you should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior, and then allow Him to begin transforming you into something. So Genesis 2, 4, These are the generations of the heaven and of the earth when they were created, and the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So the God Almighty is the one that created everything you see. For the, for the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Every atheist is without excuse for being an atheist. He can see the creation. He should know that something supernatural created what he sees. And it was the Lord God. And moving on, God controls the weather. In Genesis 2, 5, it says, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. So who causes it to rain? The Lord causes it to rain. Who brings hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunamis, and earthquakes? The Lord does. And the people who do the harp stuff, the H-A-R-R-P or whatever it is, they just think they control the weather. But God is the one who is in control and the one who lets it happen. He's the one, if the devil is involved in the weather, God is the one that allows him to be involved in the weather. God is in complete control of what goes on. Nahum 1.3 says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. The Lord caused it to hell on people in the book of Exodus. He will do this again in the book of Revelation. And at this time in Genesis 2.5, it hadn't rained yet. He hadn't caused it to rain yet. He's in control of the rain. Uh, there was no rainy days. Can you imagine living in a world with perfect weather, no rainy days. And this is where Adam lived when he was created without sin. There was no need for an umbrella. Any umbrella store would have went out of business. Uh, there was no need for the weather channel. Uh, no weatherman would have had a job. And it was the same thing every day, the same temperature probably. It just felt great outside. Uh, God controls the weather, and sometimes he fools the weathermen today. They can't get it right. God controls the weather, and His hand guides the lightning. God also controls the storms in your life. If He can control the real storm, then He can guide the small storm that you're facing in your life and bring you through it. And you've heard enough about going through storms. That's probably what you hear all the time, so I'm not going to get into that. And Psalm 73, 28 says, But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put, in my put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all thy works. It should be easy to put your trust in the person who controls the weather. Uh, the same person who makes the snowfall is the same person that can get you through anything you've got going on. Uh, Genesis 2, 5 says, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, 
For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. Now remember, the Lord is just giving you another account of, account of creation here. He is going to talk about the creation of man again. There was not a man to till the ground, so the earth was incomplete without man. That shows that God's purpose was to make man make man or beings and put them in it to inhabit it. And moving on, so we see God controls the weather. God can make something out of you. Uh, you can't grow without the word. Genesis 2, 6 says, But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And now if you let God make something out of you, you have to get in the word. It cleanses your way. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Psalms 119.9 uh, Ephesians 5.26 That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Genesis 2.6 But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Stuff needs water to live and, and stay alive. There was no rain so he used a mist to water the ground. God sustains his creation. God makes it grow. God gives rain when we need things to grow and he gave us, a, gave us his word so we can get cleansing from it and grow. Uh, you can't grow without the word. Uh, people are always saying every Christian is going to have a changed life and act like a Christian. That's not true. If he doesn't read the Bible, he's not going to change. He's going to go back to living just like he lived before. You need the washing of water by the word. Jesus Christ is the living water, and you can't grow without him living in you. Uh, God kept the world from falling apart and dying out, and he can keep the saint from falling apart and dying out. Uh, you're saved and sealed into the day of redemption, but unless you let God work in you and yield to the Holy Spirit, then you're going to die early by living for the flesh. But God can keep you and keep your flesh going longer if you'll do what the book says. And moving on, the Lord wants you in his image. Genesis 2, 7 says, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So Adam, made out of the dust of the ground, Adam's name is mud. Humans are animated mud balls of sin, after the fall. He's a dirt bag. And Adam was created in his image without sin first, but then he sinned and things changed. But it does say, in the image of God made he, made he him. And for this reason, Adam was a son of God because he was created sinless. And at, at this time, Adam became king of the kingdom of heaven because God put all things under his dominion. And he was also king over the kingdom of God because he was a sinless being in the image of God. There's two kingdoms. Many, most people try to make the kingdom of heaven the same thing as the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is spiritual. The kingdom of heaven is physical. When Adam sinned, he lost the image of God. And from then on, everyone was born in the image of Adam. Just like Seth in Genesis 5 he was made, He was in the image of Adam, not in the image of God. And the only way to get back in the image of God is to be born again by believing the gospel. Only then can you enter the, into the kingdom of God. The Lord wants every person to be saved and to be in the image of God. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but his long-suffering toward us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He doesn't want you to die in your fallen image. And anyone who says that you can't be saved because of something you've done, they're lying and they're adding works to the gospel. Anyone can be saved. A reprobate can be saved. If he realizes he's a sinner and comes to Jesus Christ as the guilty sinner that he is and believes the gospel, he can be saved. Uh, there is no person that's uneligible, uneligible to be saved. There are people who don't even care about being saved and don't want to be saved and maybe they never will again but if a person has that desire in them to be saved they can be saved and anyone who says uh well you rejected jesus too many times you can't be saved or if they say it's not your time to be saved 
uh, that stuff's not in the Bible. That's not true. You can be saved if you know you're a sinner and you know the gospel and you want to be saved, then come to Jesus Christ as the guilty sinner that you are and believe on Him as your crucified, buried, and risen Savior. But only when you believe the gospel can you get back in the can you get in the image of God and become a son of God. You're not a child of God until you're saved. Before that, you're a child of the devil. Moving on, the Lord supplies all your needs. In Genesis 2, 8 through 9, it says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life is a type of Jesus Christ because it gives eternal life and because you can eat it freely. Our salvation is free. The tree of knowledge of good and evil is probably a vine tree. If you've read number 6-5, you have the only forbidden fruit, which is a grape, and it grows on a vine tree. And God took care of Adam. He gave him a perfect body. He gave him water to drink, good scenery, good food, a literal paradise. And Adam didn't see dead grass or rotten apples or homeless people on the side of the road begging for food or starvation or war. He saw nothing but the beauty of God's creation without the effect of sin. God supplied all his needs. And even though Adam hadn't sinned yet, and even though Adam had a glorified body, he still ate. Maybe he just ate and drank for the pleasure of it. But the Lord eats in his glorified body when you read about him in the Gospels after his resurrection. And we will eat in our glorified body at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So God doesn't just supply our needs. He supplies our wants. And Philippians 4.19 says, But my God shall, all, shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. But how many things that you haven't needed but just wanted as God just went ahead and gave it to you. So he supplies your needs and a lot of your wants. The same God who put man on the earth is the same God that can take care of man on the earth. Take no thought about your food and clothes and other needs. If you go to work and do what you're supposed to do, doing what God said, then God will bring the food in. And he says in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. So you need to work to eat. You work for food. And God blesses a man who works with food and clothes and a place to live. Not only do most Christians have what they need, we have what we want. God doesn't only supply our wants and our need. He doesn't only supply our needs, but he also supplies us with physical food and also spiritual food. If you live in America, then you are blessed with 24-7 access to the Word of God. And I have a Bible in every room. I have a Bible in my car. I have a Bible on my phone. I have it on my laptop. There are Bibles in hotels that I stay in, at the doctor's office, at Walmart. Uh, they sell for $1 at the Dollar Tree. Um, you are blessed beyond belief with the Word of God. And it is a shame not to read the Word of God and to starve yourself spiritually when you have the Word of God laying around everywhere, it would be like a man who's starving to death, wanting food. He's got food all over the house, yet he doesn't eat any of it. But the same God who made the earth and the heavens is the same God who left His words everywhere for you to read. Genesis 2, 8, 9, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there He put the man whom He had formed, and He put Aaron, and He... And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Notice that the tree of knowledge of good and evil isn't the only tree that is pleasant to the sight. It's just that, just, just that the eyes of man are never satisfied. Uh, men have their own wife who looks good to them or look good to them at one point, yet they want to look at everybody else's wife. Men have a nice car, yet they want the one at the dealership. Men have a nice house, yet they drive through the subdivisions looking at everyone else's house. The eyes of man are never satisfied. But all the trees that God made were pleasant to the sight, not just the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
that's a key thing to notice. God makes the trees grow. He is the one responsible for all the beautiful creation you see. Uh, people like to go sightseeing. If they think it looks good now, imagine what the earth looked like 6,000 years ago before man got a hold of it and before man sent in a garden. It was pleasant to the sight. And God is the artist of what you see. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. When you look up at night and see the stars in the sky, that is the handiwork of the same God who can supply all your needs. Moving on, the Lord put you somewhere with a job to do. Genesis 2, 8 through 15. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. I believe every born-again believer has been placed somewhere by God with a job to do. Adam's job was to dress and to keep the garden. You need to find out what the Lord would have you to do. Until then, do something good. Give out the gospel. Put out the words of God. Do what you know is right. And out of the ground made the Lord to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. Something interesting here is there was gold. It says, And the gold of that land is good. There is the bedelium and the onyx stone. Uh, it makes you think, if God formed man out of the dust of the ground, was it gold dust? What did Adam's glorified body look like before the fall? Job 23.10 says, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Isaiah 13.12, I will make a man more precious than fine gold. Uh, Jesus' glorified body shines like the sun, and we will get a body like him. Our vile body shall be fashioned like unto his glor glorified body. There is something to study for a while. Uh, when you start talking like this, people start getting a little scared and pitching a fit. Uh, you're not supposed to talk about things in the Bible that people haven't been taught or that they haven't heard before. It makes them feel inferior, and they start calling you crazy and things like that. It's just something to talk about on a rainy day with other believers. Don't get too bent out of shape. Uh, I don't know what Adam's body looked like, and I don't know what my body will look like when I get a glorified body at the rapture either. But moving on, verse 13, it says, And the name of the second river is Gihon, the same as that which compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hittikel, Hittikel, that is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Wherever God puts you, he puts you there with a purpose. And you need to represent Jesus Christ at work. You need to have a ministry at home. Teach your wife and kids the Bible. You need to be a witness everywhere that you go. We have a job to do. We shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Uh, Adam's job was to dress and to keep the garden. Work can be pleasurable, and it was for Adam. He didn't have any body pain or fatigue. The work of God can be pleasurable for us today. I find no greater joy than studying and making these studies, reading my Bible and talking about the Bible, listening to preaching, uh, there is no greater joy than the joy that is in the things of God and laboring in the Word for hours and hours. You can labor in the Word so much that you get to a point where you can labor in the Word so much that you get to a point where you want to and desire to just stay in the Bible all the time. It isn't like, oh man, I have to read my Bible again today or I have to study again today. Uh, you want to read it. And sometimes I'd rather study than read. Sometimes I'd rather read than I would study. But if you do it long enough, then you'll desire it. And next, 
I want to say that God's salvation is free. In Genesis 2, 16 through 17, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And this is the first covenant or agreement that God has with man. Adam and Eve can live in perfect peace for eternity as long as they don't eat off of that tree. And that's an instruction completely different than what we are given today. And to deny that is to deny the clear teachings of the Bible. Adam could eat anything he wanted for free. Jesus Christ is my tree of life. Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh, left heaven and lived a sinless life for me. He died on the cross for me. He was buried and rose again the third day for me. And if we believe that gospel, we can be saved. It is free to believe. It's easy to believe. And I'm about as much of an easy believist as it gets. Easy believism is right. Easy prayerism is wrong. If a man believes in his heart on the Lord Jesus Christ and then he is saved, it is as simple as that and the salvation is free. No works are involved. And Paul teaches that in verses like Romans 4, 5 and Romans 5, 16 calls it a free gift. And many people like to drive around and use coupons, get a free drink at one place, get a free burger at another place, get a free large fry at another place. So they got their whole meal for free. But salvation is more free than that. Even the free stuff here on earth, you end up having to give something to get it. You got to buy one to get one free. You had to pay for the gas to get there. Uh, God's salvation is entirely free. You don't do anything to get it. It's so free that what you did before you were saved and what you did after you were saved is a separate issue from the salvation itself. Someone said a changed life is required for salvation. No, it isn't. You couldn't live sanctified enough for your life to match Jesus Christ or to match what Jesus Christ is wanting you to live anyway. And next, God's punishment is sure. Genesis 2.17 says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. God gave Adam one commandment and he broke it. Adam was created sinless and he could have lived in the garden forever without any pain. He chose his wife over God. He chose his, uh, his wife chose her own desires over God. And one thing is sure, they died when they ate the fruit. One thing is sure, if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, you will burn in hell for eternity because God's punishment is sure. Adam lived in a time where there was a sin that could take away his eternal life. And to deny that is to deny what the Bible said. If Adam hadn't eaten of the tree, he could have lived forever. He would have still been here on the earth. As long as he had abstained from a certain sin, he would have lived in a perfect, unbroken fellowship with God. He would have still been here on the earth 6,000 years later. And we are living in a time when if we believe the gospel, nothing can cause us to lose our salvation. There is no sin today that could cause me to be ineligible to believe the gospel and receive eternal life. There is no sin that I can commit as a Christian to take away my eternal life. And the most devilish and perverted man in the world could come to Jesus Christ and be saved. Any reprobate can be saved. And the Bible even says, Christ is in you except you be reprobates. Uh, the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ is greater than your sin. It was greater than Adam's sin. And when Jesus Christ died and rose again, Adam was able to go to the third heaven because perfect blood had been shed and it was applied to him. But God's punishment is sure. If you reject the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you will face the consequences. God told Adam, Thou shalt surely die. And that is what happened. Adam died spiritually and later died physically because he went against what God said. And moving on, God will give you somebody. Genesis 2, 18 through 25 says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib 
which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So Adam had all the animals. He was given authority to name all the animals, yet he was still lonely. And God puts it inside of a person to want somebody else. 99% of people want a husband or a wife. And most people aren't like the Apostle Paul who didn't desire a woman. So he didn't have to get married. He had a gift that most people don't have. Most people desire a mate. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 6 through 9, But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, and another after that. I save therefore to the unmarried and widows. It is good for them if they abide even as I, but if they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. It is better to marry than to burn in your lust. If God put the desire for a mate in you, then he will give you a mate. You just have to wait on him. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be looking. It means you need to wait on him to bring the right one. Don't marry an unbeliever. If you marry an unbeliever, then they will lead you off into sin. Just like it says in 1 Kings eleven four. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. Don't marry someone who doesn't want the same relationship with God as you do. If you are a King James Bible-believing Christian, then you need to try and marry a King James Bible-believing Christian. A lot of people ask the question about interracial marriage. But in the New Testament, I don't believe there is any commandment to marry that you have to marry your own race. The command is to marry another Christian. 1 Kings 7, 2 through 3, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. And then in the same chapter, verse 39 said, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord, meaning only another Christian. So the Lord gave Adam and help meet for him. And God will give you a help meet. Pray about it and then put action to it to find one. But in Genesis 2.21 it says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And who would you rather have perform a surgical operation on you than God himself? Sure, he could have just made a new rib or made Eve without a piece of Adam, but he wanted the woman to be part of the man. And Adam was put to sleep and pierced in his side to get his bride, just like Jesus Christ was pierced in his side and died to get his bride. In John nineteen thirty four, it talks about where it says, One of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. That's what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus died for us. We're his bride. Adam was put into a deep sleep, a type of death, to get his bride. So you can see Jesus Christ on every page of the Bible. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. The church is the bride of Christ, and Jesus Christ died to get his bride. Genesis 2.22, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And boys play in dirt better because Adam came directly from the dirt but Eve came from Adam. Verse 23, and Adam, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Notice no blood is mentioned, only bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Remember in the New Testament it says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It's possible. Notice I said it's possible. Glorified bodies don't have blood as we have it. And Jesus said in Luke twenty four thirty nine, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. And now verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So Adam and Eve are married and in perfect fellowship with God and each other. And there were no fights. She wasn't mad about him leaving his socks all over the floor. 
uh, because he didn't even wear socks. He was naked. Uh, he wasn't worried about men looking at her body, even though she was naked. He didn't have to be jealous. Uh, they didn't go to bed looking at their phones instead of talking to, uh, talking to each other. They probably slept out in nature just enjoying each other's company. They had a perfect marriage, a perfect life. Uh, the Bible says, He that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. It is better to, better to marry than to burn. And if you can stay single, then you should. But you can serve God better single if you have that gift. But most people don't have that gift because you desire someone. So you need to get married. God's plan for most people is for them to get married. And the creation of Eve proves that. The creation of Eve also proves that God isn't for sodomy. He didn't make a man for Adam. The creation of Eve also proves that God isn't for bestiality. Uh, he didn't have Adam marry one of the animals. His plan is for one man to get with one woman and be together until they die. So even from the creation of man, you can see God's plan for us. His power, his protection, his purpose for making us, which is, his, is for his pleasure. And you can see also there are penalties for not doing what he wants us to do.